This video is meant to describe some of the developmental theories that will be important to us throughout the semester and give some ways to think about them. If you were to consider all of the things that influence human development, you could come up with a list of dozens, hundreds, or even potentially thousands of things that impact the person that we become. Some things are obvious, like our parents, or our siblings, or the religion that we're raised in, or the kind of access to education that we get. There are also things like the weather or prenatal environments that can influence the kind of person that we become. So it's the job of theorists, developmental theorists, to put these influences into categories or into theories to help us understand how this all works cohesively. One analogy that can be useful when we think about developmental theories is that of the elephant in the dark cave. If you were to ask people in a dark cave to feel around for the elephant that was in the middle and then to describe what an elephant was, each person would end up finding a different part of the elephant in the dark. They'd fumble around and get their hand on the tusk or maybe the trunk or the ear or the tail and then when asked what is an elephant, the person who would grab the tusk would say, oh, it's long and it's smooth. The person who grabbed the ear would say, it's floppy and big. The person who grabbed the tail would say, oh, it's really bristly. None of those accurately describe what an elephant is, but they all provide a part. And that's kind of how theories are in psychology as well. None of them describe the entirety of human development, but they can each provide a part. So for example, the psychoanalytic theories discussed in the book might be the equivalent of grabbing the tail. In particular here, keep in mind that psychosocial theories like that from Eric Erickson, who says that at each stage of development we face a crisis or an internal battle between two outcomes. For example, during infancy, babies are impacted by their social environments like their caregivers to either develop trust of their caregivers if their needs are met or mistrust of their caregivers if their needs aren't met. And we have one of these kinds of battles at each of our stages of development. We're going to talk about that throughout the semester. Then there's the behaviorist theories. This is like the social learning theory that monkey see, monkey do, which we'll talk about numerous times because as we grow up, we often will model or mimic other people, and this is social learning theory or observational learning. We'll talk about cognitive theories. Uh, Jean Piaget is the person in cognitive theories who is the most influential, and he basically says children are fundamentally different thinkers than adults. It's not the case that they have the same skills, but just not as good of skills as adults. It's actually, according to Piaget, the case that they have different skills, and that as we move in age, that we develop these skills through stages. And we'll talk about those stages throughout the semester. Then there's epigenetic theories, and there'll be a lecture shortly on epigenetic theories, the idea of how is it that our genes influence who we are and interact with the environment. There are also sociocultural theories that talk about how our culture and our social environments can impact who we are, and even a few more that the book covers. But the point is, none of these theories accurately explains what development is entirely. Each one just is a piece, kind of like if people were trying to grasp at that elephant, they would each grab a different piece. We're not really talking about elephants, of course. We're really talking about human development. And let's say that we have a, a toddler who is throwing a temper tantrum, and we're trying to develop a theory about why it is that children throw temper tantrums. Each of these theory perspectives would give you different ideas and different theories or predictions about what would cause that behavior. Does it mean that one is right and the other is wrong? Probably not. It probably means that they all have a piece to the overarching puzzle, uh, and that altogether that they provide the most thorough description of human development possible. So you might be wondering, well, isn't there a way that we can tie all of these theories together? And there is one theory that does a pretty good job of that, and it's called ecological systems theory. It was proposed by a guy named Yuri Bronfenbrenner, and Bronfenbrenner's main thesis was that children, or people, are products of and producers of their environments, and that these environments are interdependent. So what it means to be a product and a producer of one's environment is that we are the products of or we are influenced by our environment and our genetics, but that we actually help to create our environment and we actually shape our genetics. So it's kind of like a cycle where our environments and our genetics impact the kind of people that we are and then the kind of people that we ought become impact our environments and our genetics and it goes in a cycle like that over and over and over again so everything is interconnected he also says that outside of the self and that when we look at the social and cultural influences that those are interdependent as well
So his theory has multiple layers. It starts in the center with the individual. The individual level basically describes the biological characteristics that a person brings into the world, largely genetic information, so things like height and skin color and hair color, uh, any athletic abilities or music abilities, any diseases or illnesses, those kinds of things count here in the center as the individual level. Then if we move out, we can see that there are outside systems from the person who, that influence the person directly, and those are called microsystems. So a few examples of microsystems are the family, where a person goes to school, or where they grow up. Of course, it's possible for these microsystems to interact, and we call that level of analysis the mesosystem. So in the mesosystem, you see that there are interactions between the separate microsystems. So for example, one microsystem is the immediate family, like the parents, and another microsystem is the child's school. It's definitely possible and happens very commonly where the parents and the school or the teacher at the school interact with one another, and that those interactions can influence the child. So it's possible that the teachers tell the parents something about the child that impact the way the parents deal with the child and that would count as a mesosystem because it's an interaction between microsystems. Moving out one step further we get to the exosystem. The exosystem are things that indirectly influence the children usually through a microsystem. So over on the right we see the parents workplace as one of these. It's definitely the case that if a person who is a parent has a bad day at work that they may come home stressed out and angry and that might make them a poorer parent. They might be unavailable to their child or they might be more likely to yell or be harsh in discipline. So in that way, the workplace has therefore influenced the individual or the child, but not directly. It's done this through the family, which is the microsystem. One more level out brings us to the macrosystem. The macrosystem includes the larger social and cultural context, so things like the laws of a country or a place and the values and customs. As an example, there's the No Child Left Behind law that was passed about a decade ago in the United States. If you were a child who went to school before that law, your experience at school was significantly different than if you were a child who went to school after that law. So the law leads to different developmental experiences and even different developmental outcomes. The last level of the ecological systems theory that is oftentimes left off is the chronosystem. And the chronosystem takes into account time as a factor in development. Now we're not talking about time about regarding whether something happens or not, but about when it happens. So for example, let's say that we have a child whose parents got divorced. It's definitely the case that the divorce would influence a child because the divorce would be a microsystem, something directly impacting the individual. But it's also the case that the time at which that happened in a child's development would influence the way that it impacts them. So for example, a child who's two when their parents got divorced has different outcomes than a child who was 12 and they have a different outcome than a child who's 22 or even 42. Regardless of your age, the time at which any particular event happens can change the way that it influences development.